So Brian Trench is behind me here. And I think you all know Brian. He's going to give a talk here for us on science writing and why it matters. Um, we have it on record so we can save it for anybody who wasn't here, who didn't make it, and they can have a look after the event. So I'll just introduce Brian. And thanks very much, Brian, for coming to talk to us here. As um, previously announced, I was intending to speak about science writing in relation to two cases, uh, Agnes Mary Clark and Mary Mulvill. Uh, for those who don't know what they look like, there's a, an image <laughs> of Agnes Mary Clark and Mary Mulvill. Um, uh, if you were to indicate on the fingers of one hand or two hands, uh, how well might you know about Agnes Mary Clark? If one finger means I've heard the name and not much else, and ten fingers means I I know her work, what would that be like? Agnes Mary. Well, I know Mary Mulville's work. No, oh, but I, I was just asking about Agnes Mary Clark. No, moment, no. Okay, so I can I can introduce you to her, uh, and Mary Mulville, in, again, fingers of two hands, uh, where I would count myself as ten, knowing her very well. I have three, five, two. Well, okay, um. But just thinking about you know what is science writing, one way of uh, getting into it is just you know what's on the shelves of bookshops uh, under the heading popular science, general science, or sometimes just science. And this is Wexford Book Center a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago. Um, and there's a selection of, I suppose, about 50, 60, maybe 80 titles, uh, which indicates straight away there's a readership. Uh, and there's uh, an audience for science writing, which um, I think we know very little about Sean. Um, but if we look at the other image I have here, the pile of books on the floor, the one title that's clearly outselling all the rest, and that is Luke O'Neill's To Boldly Go Where No Book Has Gone Before, uh, which says something about you know, what, what makes, has an impact, and that's a personality with a high media profile, with a very convivial manner, uh, and a, a catchy title on the book. But one thing that strikes me immediately looking at a selection of books like that is that they fall into two categories in terms of authorship, between books that are written by scientists who are occasional Book writers, occasional writers, maybe also you know, by formats and other media, and books that are written by people who are more or less or actually full time science writers. So, on the top shelf, there is uh, are two books by Philip Ball. I have one of them here, Beautiful Experiments, uh, and the other one is, came out almost at the same time. Philip Ball turns out books like other people have dinners. Um, the other book is How Life Works, which is not modest in its ambition, nor is this modest in its ambition. It's the history of science is told in an illustration, part of an illustrated form through 60 experiments. Um, and so he, he's one of the full time science writers. John Riven is there, and has been for decades now. Um, and then you've got you know, uh, scientists like Carlo Rovelli. Uh, and actually, in the category, somewhere in the, between the categories is Dawkins. I'm not quite sure. He hasn't done science for decades. Uh, so maybe he's grown over from being a scientist who occasionally writes to being a full time uh, science writer who used to be a scientist. Um, and actually, uh, most of the well known names in science writing in Britain are people with this, a background in science, most, many of them. At least doctorates and some of them with research early involvement in research. Um, there's another way to think about this as well. So that's one way of thinking just who writes books about science and what are, what are they about and how do they treat science. Uh, the organizations that we're connected with in the, the wider world include organizations mainly connected with the word journalists in the title. But actually, our nearest neighbor to the Association of British Science Writers and our nearest neighbors to the West are the National Association of Science Writers of the United States. 
and one of the more recent organizations in, the, in this uh, field is uh, SWIM, the Science Writers of, of Italy. And so I was thinking, I, I checked, you know, how does the ABSW, the British organization, how does it define science writing in terms of its uh, scope? And then it lists radio, television, podcasts, online work, and so on, which, you know, involves as much talking and listening as they do writing in some cases. So I think there's liberties taken uh, with, with the word, and I think ABSW is really a historical overhang from the time that it was set up in the 1940s uh, by two uh, journalists who would have seen themselves very much as writers because they wrote opinion pieces, they wrote features, they wrote analyses, and not just, and maybe not even mainly, news reports. Uh, and in science communication, which is my own field, excuse me, in science communication, which is my own field, um, the distinction is quite often made between the scientist who occasionally does public communication and the science communicator who has a vocation or a profession uh, that is a data science communication, a full time science communicator. Uh, and historically, we can make this distinction too in terms of popularizing scientists who write in books or magazines and, and, and the science writer who looks in, in science from the outside. Uh, in, in Ireland, we don't have many examples or models or, or to, to look to. Um, I don't know if many of you know the name Brenton McWilliams. Uh, Brenton yes. McWilliams was a meteorologist. Uh, I think he was the deputy uh, director of, of what's now in that area. And he started in 1988 a daily column for the Irish Times, which he sustained for nearly 20 years, while continuing to be a meteorologist. It was called Weather Eye. And actually, you can get a collection of, of, of some of the columns that he wrote uh, under that title, Weather Eye, uh, published posthumously, uh, edited by his, uh, his wife, now widow. Um, and so over that period, he must have written several thousand of these short pieces of observation and reflection. Uh, and you, what you will, will see if you just dip into the collection in the book. Uh, that he's a man of he was a man of broad culture. He wasn't just writing about weather. Uh, although, if you write about weather, you immediately get into thinking about how do we perceive weather, who talks about weather, who cares about weather, uh, and, and, and whose livelihoods does weather influence more most, and so on. So there's a social and there's a cultural and there's an intellectual, there's a historical perspective, uh, uh, an interest running through uh, his, his uh, columns. So I think he arguably spans the divide between the popularizing scientist and the part-time near professional uh, science writer. But there are not that many other examples that we can call on. Uh, and interestingly, therefore, uh, when I look for an example, an early example of a professional science writer, I find Agnes Mary Clark, um, born in 1842, died in 1907, uh, Irish born uh, to a mixed Protestant Catholic family in, in County Cork. She was educated at home there and then in Dublin. Uh, she, as a child, she showed an interest in astronomy, read the works of Herschel, who was the, one of the leading astronomers in the 19th century. Um, and uh, based in London, as she was for the last 30 or 40 years of her life, having spent some time in Italy, she started uh, writing on astronomy for um, the Edinburgh Review, sort of middle brow to high journal. Uh, but as was the custom, she wrote anonymously, or rather the articles were published anonymously. So people didn't know necessarily if they're reading man or woman, an Irish person, an English person, something else altogether. Um, but she became very well uh, regarded for the quality of her writing, not just by the general education readership of the Edinburgh Review and other publications that she wrote about, but also by practicing scientists. 
And so she's identified by the science historian Bernard Leighton, who's written on science popularization uh, extensively, as a popularizer for practitioners, as well as for the science interested public. And so why does science writing matter? Part of the answer to the question, I think, is because it matters to scientists who are specialized. And by the end of the 19th century, specialization uh, had really taken hold. Uh, people were no longer just a natural philosopher able to dip into what we now regard as physics and chemistry and biology, uh, but, but uh, they were defined in terms of not just astronomy, but even branches of astronomy and so on. So they needed increasingly, and this remains the case today, uh, even more so, they need generally accessible writing to know what's going on actually possibly even in the office next door or in the lab next to theirs or yeah uh, if you want some fun uh, and so popularization is not just uh, transporting scientific it's scientific information and ideas to the public whoever the public may be uh, but also to those of, in other parts of the scientific world other scientific communities uh, and so really, Margaret Huggins, who was also Irish born and also an astronomer, uh, who had the advantage or disadvantage, I don't know, of being married to a leading astronomer, which gave her access to uh, societies, uh, conferences, and so on. Anyway, she was a good friend of Clark's. I wrote in appreciation of Clark after her death that the progress of science and the growth of its literature during the last quarter of a century, so we're talking about the quarter of a century from 1880 probably, has been so enormous that a new order of work is imperatively called, whose mission is to collect, collate, correlate, and digest the mass of observations and papers to prepare material for experts and at the same time to inform and interest the general public. Um, uh, it's, it's probably the case that a lot of dedication to special science journalists uh, also spans of this too audience, if you like, the specialist of the scientifically employed public and the scientifically interested public. Uh, but um, this was an articulation of that dual purpose, as were, uh, in relation to science writing, even before there was such a thing as science journalism. It wasn't science journalism for another 20 or 30 years after that. Um, now, Clark had a scientific education, self-education uh, in, in the field, uh, but she won the esteem and recognition of the community of scientists to the extent that she was actually offered a job uh, as, a, 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 as a computer. A computer was a person, as you know, in the late 19th century, a mid in the late 19th century, at Greenwich Observatory, and she was even offered a, a chair in astronomy at an, an American uh, women's college, but she declined both of those offers. And um, one of her, what, what brought her name to attention, as distinct from, you know, she being the anonymous or pseudonymous author of works that, of, that people read and admired, but what brought her name to, to attention was her popular history of astronomy during the 19th century. And I'm holding here a copy from the RDS Library of a fourth edition of the work. So the first edition appeared in, 19, in 1885, and this fourth edition was published in 1902. Uh, and it's actually dead stamped when it arrived in the library here, just beside us, in, on the 24th of December, 1902. Um, and, the paper, and the paper has been a little bit affected by the not optimal conditions of the library here, but I just got this one from the library today. I previously consulted a different edition, and as I was just flicking through it to find something that I was going to bring to your attention, out jumps a news cutting, which I've now lost again, which has been resting in the pages of this book for several decades. There we are. <laughs> it's, not, it's been there so long, but it's actually discolored the pages that it's resting between. And it's called 
how to be healthy this winter. Uh, with winter at hand, it behoves everyone to take special precautions not to catch colds. I can't quickly put a date on it. Uh, it looks like it's the uh, Irish Independent, I think. It's got golf results on, on the reverse of the article about keep being healthy. But anyway, this may be the last time that the book was actually taken out of the library. or well, sometime, it looks like about the 1940s or 50s. Um, I think. There's, it's a good reason for joining the library here, by the way, being a member of the society that you come across these little gems. Anyway, the popular history of astronomy uh, during, the, during the 19th century was very vigorous, and it made a big name at the time. And it was very well reviewed. And I'll give you just a flavor of some of the reviews, if you don't mind, because it, it, it speaks to, they speak to a certain part of what I want to uh, emphasize with science writing. So the Royal Astronomer of Ireland, Robert Ball, reviewed popular history of astronomy by Agnes Mary Clark in Nature, in the Journal of Nature, as a masterly exposition of the results of modern astronomy, quote, uh, unquote, and a, quote, vivid and accurate summary of what has been done in field. In this respect, Ball added, few men of science, people who did science were men, Few men of science who use this book will think it ought to be classed as a popular book in the ordinary acceptation. So this was sort of popularization at a very high level that could, as it were, stand the scrutiny of the specialists in the various parts of astronomy that she was describing as an accurate summary of what's been done in, in these fields. It was reprinted and republished uh, several times uh, up to 1902 being the fourth edition. In those years, in the 15, 17 years after she published the first edition of this book, Clark also published The System of the Stars, 1890, The Herschels of Modern Astronomy, 1895, Problems in Astrophysics, 1903, which was actually a, a setting of the agenda for physics in, in the 20th century. And all the assessments of her work are striking in how they agree on her literary ability. They draw attention to the literary characteristics of the writing. And that's something that I you know, would like to emphasize in relation to science writing, uh, in thinking of it not just as transposition or transporting of science to a wider audience, but also transformation and giving new meaning uh, and new context uh, to science through the contextualization in literary terms and intellectual terms and historical terms and social terms and social terms and so on. Uh, so um, the poet and journalist Sir Edmund Arnold, writing the Daily Telegraph, described Clark's work as a noble labor at once profound and popular in a style that is as lucid as the learning underneath it is wide, accurate, and comprehensive. Uh, and, and, and I could go on with more and more of these. Uh, kinds of, of, of comments and reviews on, on, on Clark's work. Uh, so, did it pay the bills? No. Uh, Clark wrote to a friend when she was adding up her royalties, um, some of interest to some people here, the level of royalties, and adding up her royalties on the first two editions of the popular history, one need not expect to make a livelihood of writing books. And indeed, she was doing other things. I mean, she was very Visited it very active. Uh, and she is now being accepted into the community of astronomers by being a, a founding member of the British Astronomical Association, a member of the Royal Institution, an honorary fellow of the Royal uh, Astro Astronomy Society, Astronomical Society. Um, and she wrote uh, entries for the Encyclopedia Britannica. I think, I think I saw the number 150 entries, you know, biographical entries from Galileo and Herschel. You know, lots of key people in, in astronomy. She continued to write for journals like the Edinburgh Review. Um, uh, and But in a, in a preface to the first edition, which was the one that I used for my research originally on, on, on Clark, um, she wrote that history presents what we know, so a history like this, what we know, plus how we come or how we came to know it. So it's narration uh, more than enumeration, or it's narration as well as enumeration, listening. 
And she specified that in her own work, she gave prominence to the biographical element as underlying and determining the whole course of uh, human endeavor. Um, and maybe if I give you a flavor of, of her writing, uh, I'll take the example of her writing about Parsons of Burr, you know, the great telescope that William Parsons uh, built in Burr. And she introduced, so it's in a chapter in the popular history of, of astronomy uh, called Instrumental Advances. You know, so how the technology of the observation of the skies contributed to new findings and so on. And she introduces us to Parsons in terms of his uh, aristocratic background and his role as a feudal uh, landlord, a member of the House of Commons, and then a member of the House of Lords, and so on and so on. Uh, and then in describing how he came to build this, what was the largest telescope in the world at the time, and for a long time afterwards, in the 1840s, um, he had to rely entirely on his own invention and to earn his own experience. Uh, there's now a passing reference to somebody else, uh, James Short. Moreover, Lord Oxmantown, so Parsons' uh, noble title was Lord Oxmantown and later Earl of Ross. Lord Oxmantown had no skilled workman to assist him. His implements, both animate and inanimate, had to be formed by himself. Peasants taken from the plough were educated by him into efficient mechanics and engineers. The delicate and complex machinery needed in operations of such hairbreadth nicety as his enterprise involved, the steam engine which was to set it in motion, at times the very crucibles in which his specular issued from his own workshops. Now, I, it's hard for us to judge that writing 100 plus years later, but, but actually it's, I think if you, if you read Victorian, Edwardian, whatever, uh, writing, you might just be struck by the fact that the sentences are actually quite short. You know, and that we would you know, take that as one kind of mark of popular acceptance writing is, is short sentences. Uh, and it actually is quite a rhythm to the writing. Uh, she, it reads quite easily, even 120 plus years later. But to the point about using biography, narration, to tell the stories of science, in other words, uh, as a way of explaining how we've come to know things, what they mean, how it came to me, uh, she really anticipates, or well, she points us in the direction of Mary uh, Mulville. Uh, Mary Mulville uh, was born in 1959, died in 2015. And her major work was the uh, encyclopedic, uh, but also very readable, Ingenious Ireland, published in 2002, and then republished in 2019 after her death. Uh, and she uses frequently uh, mini biographies through that to explain uh, the significance of uh, work that was done in this place or the geology of that place, because it's, it's, it's organized in terms of places, uh, or the industrial heritage of that particular place, and so on. And I'm not suggesting that her uh, influenced. Uh, Mary Mulville, in fact, reading the short note on Clark in Indianus Ireland, I can't be sure that she, that Mary had ever read uh, how these facts were, though she was well aware of them, uh, because there was a, an article, an essay about Clark in one of those uh, collections of essays about women scientists that Mary edited, uh, the first one of those uh, called Star Shells and Bluebells. Um, now, uh, uh, sorry, I'm hesitating because I know that some of the people listening are, are know Mary's work uh, well, um, and I thought I knew pretty well, and then I was able to dip into the archives that she's left, which are now catalogued in the Dublin City University, and the rarest actually there are lots of things I didn't know about Mary, with whom I cooperated in many projects through the Irish Science Journalists Association, as it was then. She and I actually organized a public event in November 1993 under the title Science of Communication. Um, and indirectly out of that, I developed, not actually fairly directly out of that, 
I developed a master's of communication in, in, in DC and we started two years later. Um, and anyway, as I say, uh, I knew her very well uh, through professional and uh, personal connections. And yet I didn't know that Mary, before she studied journalism, before she started thinking about writing about science, was considering literary writing as her own. Uh, and she wrote poetry. And the poems that she wrote in 1985, 86, 87, or some of them anyway, are, are in uh, the archive of her, her papers. I consider that significant uh, because I think that uh, good reading, wide reading, um, literary reading is essential to good writing on any level whether it's on science or sport or whatever, the question sport, which was surrounding the period of um, uh, an awareness of, you know, rhythms of writing and cadences of writing, and metaphor and analogy and illustration and so on, are all part of writing science, writing about sciences as they are about writing about other things. And Mary had wide cultural interests and was a, a, a voracious reader a very keen reader. And in 1988, she and some friends set up a book club, which remarkably is still what 35 years later. Now that was before book clubs were proper for popular in 1988. They became very, very popular in, in, in the following decades. And uh, a member of that book club tells me that in 1993, Mary, as well as the others in the book club, listed uh, their top 10 books. And her top 10 books included work by Tony Morrison, Colette, Harper Lee, J.M. Curtsy, uh, I'm not pronouncing his name quite correctly, a South African writer, and Ernest, Ernest Hemingway, and nothing about science, nothing directly related to science. Uh, and, and I, again, I didn't know this about her, um, even though we you know, there are no other members of that uh, book club. Um, and I'm sorry that, as one often is, after somebody has, has taken far too soon, but never had the conversations on could have, might have. Uh, I wouldn't have been admitted to the book club because we're women only book club. But anyway, what I'm saying is that, you know, uh, the wide interest and ease in reading right, uh, of various kinds is important to being a significant uh, writer. And uh, in Genius Ireland, which, which was a madly ambitious project, uh, she gave herself six months to collect some information about places of scientific interest around the country. Uh, and it turned out to be six years of, of, of research, uh, which stand up very well. You obviously think it needs to be updated in terms of the time that's passed since 2002, but it has, uh, as Cormac, uh, our chair and our colleague in the association had remarked in an essay about Mary, it has the range and authority of an encyclopedia, and this is a nice phrase from Cormac, with the intimacy that comes with a single authorial voice. Uh, and that single authorial voice is that quality of writing uh, that uh, accessibility, that sense of humor, that cultural awareness, and so on, uh, that, that Mary had, <clears throat> and that she brought into writing for the Irish Times uh, uh, when she had a column on the, on the science page uh, for the Irish writing for an Irish Women's Diary, uh, occasionally on figures from the history of science. And even when she was writing straight out of college, she was writing news for the news pages, not, not straight out of college. She had edited Technology Ireland for a time and then went into freelance writing, mainly for the Irish Times. But even, uh, even then, when she was writing for the news pages, she rarely did, uh, and this is not to demean those who do such stories, but she rarely did the routine science reporting of the kind that researchers in Institution X have found Y in, uh, published in, as published in the journal Z. Uh, you know the format, uh, which is 
standard and had been used for decades now. Uh, and I did uh, a search for the word breakthrough uh, in all of the articles in her name in the Irish Times article, digital uh, archive, 250 plus articles, I found breakthrough in just eight. Even as I say, writing in the news pages, she uh, could. She found a way to do it in with literary feeling. So she's writing in 1994 about chocolate. It's Easter. She writes about chocolate, and she starts as Technogos drank it as an aphrodisiac. Casanova voted it his favorite drink, and botanists call it the food of the gods. And she goes on then to talk about what is the particular substance in chocolate. The acronym is PEA. I've forgotten what PE and A stand for. Uh, but the pleasure of giving substance in chocolate PA. And she talks about the history of the cacao uh, bean. Uh, in 1995, she's wondering about drizzle. We had a bit of that side today. That fine, soft rain so common in the west of Ireland when the drops seem not to fall but to hang in the air. Oh, very visual, very visual, striking visual uh, image there. And then that's the basis for an interview uh, with a University of College Galway, as it was then, physicist, uh, Jerry Jennings, the Cross uh, of Drizzle. The last piece that Mary wrote in the Irish Times was about the astronomer Annie Russell, who's been in Strabane, whose work had to be published under her, had to be published, sorry under the conventions at the time that we published under her husband's name. He was called Maunder. And it was the last column she wrote in the Irish Times. And possibly the last, I suppose, the last piece of journalism that was published. Um, and she drew attention in it to discrimination against women. And so the work of a science writer is held together not just by threads of science, but also of worldview and of cultural <laughs> awareness uh, and Mary's conviction in science and invention, particularly that done by women, deserved greater recognition in the telling of Irish history. That will thread through very much of her work. She went by several descriptions uh, on the plaque on her home uh, that commemorates her. She's described as a science journalist and a pioneer in science communication. But she did it. She was a trainer. She was a tour guide. She was a copywriter. Uh, she ghost wrote, she did radio presenting uh, well, very actively through the 1990s. But on the end note on her Irish Times column, she, various formulations were used to describe her. And strikingly, on the last of those columns, the one I just referred to, and Annie Russell, the note reads <laughs> Mary Mulville is a science writer. So I'll leave you with that thought. Uh, well, she was a science writer first and foremost. Thank you, Brian. That was great.